excited to bring up our next speaker. Um, just like caves, we're going to go into another really unique part of the world and explore some biodiversity there. We're going to bring in Amanda Kahn. Amanda is assistant professor and invertebrate ecologist at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories and San Jose State University. Her research explores the secret life of sponges and what they contribute to their ecosystems and the timescales that they operate on. And she has a specific focus on the deep sea. So I am very excited to welcome Amanda to the Global BioFest. Hi there. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice Thank to meet you, you so too. much yeah. for all your great organization with this. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And I'm really excited to learn about sponges. I don't know anything about them. So I'm going to hand it right over to you um, so we can get started. Sounds great. I will begin sharing my screen. All right. I'll let you know when it pops up here. Okay, perfect. Looking for some underwater sponges. Okay, I think I see something come in. Okay, I'm going to hide that little icon. Okay. <laughs> And we're good to go. We're good. Okay. Well, hello. I am hoping uh, to introduce you to a different piece of biodiversity that maybe you haven't thought about uh, too hard before, and that is the secret lives of sponges. Um, and this is really because to effectively conserve something, we first need to understand it. So my research aims to explore these secret lives of sponges and specifically to understand what they contribute to their ecosystems and at what pace they do that at. Um, and so really these are uh, ancient animals that have existed for over half a million, or sorry, half a billion years, um, over 600 million years. Um, they're ancient, ancient animals. And um, really knowing more about them tells us a lot about evolution and early ocean ecosystems as well. And so I want to start by setting the stage for where I am. Um, so I am speaking to you from Monterey Bay, California in the United States. And this is what our coastline looks like um, off of the coast of Big Sur, California. We have these sheer cliffs uh, with pounding surf reaching the coastline. And uh, that pounding surf really plays a strong role in the types of life that live here on the coastline. Um, and it makes the ocean look pretty inhospitable. And indeed, it is pretty inhospitable for humans. And yet life thrives beneath the surface. And this festival has been amazing for getting to learn about some of that biodiversity that lives just at that interface between the land and the ocean. And even farther down, we see a wealth of ocean resources that live beneath the waves. So we have beautiful kelp forests, and microscopic phytoplankton that form the basis of a diverse and beautiful ecosystem harboring many invertebrates and fish like you see here. And these in turn support larger animals like seals and whales. Now that sheer coastline actually extends underwater as well. So um, I'm gonna be speaking about research that happens right here out of Moss Landing, where Moss Landing Marine Laboratories is. Um, and uh, it extends, you can see this snaking canyon here. So that's the Monterey Submarine Canyon. And if you were to drain Monterey Bay of its water, the Monterey Canyon would rival the Grand Canyon in terms of depth and has these really sheer, um, sheer cliff uh, and slopes. Now, getting to that canyon is easy from Monterey Bay, but accessing the deep ocean there is tough. And so for that, we need technology. This icon shows the depths that we could get to by scuba. And so instead we use uh, technology like these remotely operated vehicles that work as our eyes and our hands underwater. And this is the remotely operated vehicle Doc Ricketts of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And you can see these robotic arms which work as our hands to collect pieces of sponge tissue and bring them up for study. Um, and they also can hold on to instruments so that we can take measurements at the place where these animals live. And so with this technology, we can see what much of the ocean looks like. So in contrast to those coastal regions I showed you, this is what most of the ocean looks like. It's dark. It has weird animals. This is the barrel eye spook fish. It has these massive eyes that are housed inside of a transparent bulb in its head that allow it to take up any bits of light that might reach it in its deep depths. 
Or we have this deep sea angler fish with a bioluminescent lure that helps to attract prey toward its mouth as it drifts through the deep sea. And then on the deep sea floor, we have interesting adaptations as well, like these um, filter feeding sea squirts that have given up their filter feeding ways to become carnivores. And they look like a giant mouth on a stalk here. Um, or these, uh, these worms that live in hydrothermal vent regions like we heard about this morning, uh, which have these amazing associations with bacteria to let them take up poisons and use that as food. Basically, how and why do these bizarre things evolve? Well, it's because the deep sea is a tough place to live. It's very cold, it's completely dark, and there's very little oxygen, and there's very little food. Uh, and so because there is so much food limitation, that can really drive the adaptations of the animals that we see. So that was a little bit about what some animals look like on the deep sea. Here's a picture of the deep sea floor. This is the abyssal plain, and this is what much of the deep ocean looks like. You see this silty, sandy bottom. This is off the coast of California uh, at a long-term study site called Station M, um, studied by scientist Ken Smith since 1989 from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And um, these are time-lapse photos that were taken every hour. And you can see that the seafloor is covered with sea cucumbers and this nose-shaped sea urchin that's snuffling around in the sediments. And so there's quite a lot of activity. And yet also, it's not quite as densely packed as you would see in shallow water. And this is, this is because um, not a lot of food reaches the deep sea floor. Only about 1% to 3% of the food from the surface reaches the deep sea. I do want to point out these white things over here are sponges. So just since we're going to talk about sponges shortly, I wanted to point them out. And you'll see more here. So that's what most of the deep sea floor looks like. And yet in some places, animals flourish. This is Sir Ridge, a deep sea ridge off the coast of California. And it has these many beautiful deep sea corals, like those bubblegum corals, and then these massive sponges that are over a meter tall and a meter across. Now, we're all familiar with coral reefs as hotspots of diversity in shallow oceans. Sponges can also play that role along with corals in the deep sea. So these are hotspots of biodiversity that can support a foundation of an ecosystem with crabs, sea slugs, octopuses, and fishes. And yet, these areas are still in the deep ocean, and there is still not a lot of food. Uh, so what we are researching is how the animals that form the foundation of these habitats, the sponges and the corals, uh, are contributing to other animals that live among them. And this is not just a California phenomenon. Deep sea sponges are common throughout the world. And in fact, in the North Atlantic, um, you can see these oster beds, uh, these white volleyball sized lumps are all sponges. And these massive aggregations of sponges are called oster, which translates to cheese bottoms in Norwegian, because on sonar, fishermen insist that they look like the holes in Swiss cheese. Um, so yes, very, very dense, uh, very abundant. And so I use technology to study deep sea sponges. Now let's talk a little bit about sponges. Sponges are animals. Uh, they are found throughout the world's oceans, and they come in all kinds of shapes and colors. They're also found in lakes, in rivers, and they can be found from tide pools all the way down to the deep sea. Anywhere that you enter the water, sponges likely can live. Um, and so, you know, these are, they can be small, they can be tube-shaped, they can be massive, but they are everywhere. And I'm interested in them for what they eat. So sponges are efficient filter feeders, which means they eat by pumping water, huge volumes of water, over 900 times their own body volume each day, in through minute pores on the surface of the sponge. And then they pump that water and filter out particles like bacteria before pumping that water out of a massive chimney at the top. And so this is a non-toxic green dye that can just show how much water is being pumped through a sponge that otherwise, without this visualization, might just look like a lump that isn't doing much on the seafloor. And yet they are doing quite a lot. 
Sponges can remove bacteria from the water with up to 95% efficiency. And those bacteria are too small for other animals to eat. And so for a sponge to be able to eat all of the particles uh, out of the water and turn it into sponge tissue could be important for moving foods into the food web. Now humans have interacted with sponges for thousands of years, starting with Greek fishermen uh, over 3000 years ago. Um, and so they would dive down holding a large rock called a scandalopetra, and then they would sink to the bottom, grab a sponge off of the seafloor, tug on a rope and be pulled back up to the boat. And so these Greek sponge divers uh, were a big deal. Uh, they would catch huge amounts of sponge. The sponge would look like this slimy black mass when it first came up out of the water. But after some cleaning, it looked, well, spongy. And um, this industry was quite large and supplied the world with sponges. Nowadays, the kitchen sponge that you use is likely made in factories out of cellulose. Um, but sponges still have their uses beyond these um, sponge uses or sponge applications. For example, many sponge species, including this deep sea species shown here, produce pharmaceutical compounds. About 30% of the marine derived medical compounds that come from marine organisms come from sponges. These can run the range from antimicrobial to antiviral uh, medicines. There are several uh, extracts from sponges that are used in the treatments of cancers and malaria. So there's a lot of medical potential that humans have used and taken advantage of from sponges. And finally, sponges make their skeletons out of silica that they extract from the seawater. And this is what their tiny silica skeletons look like. And those silica rods, silica is basically glass. So what you're seeing here is a tiny fi glass fibers that are made by the sponge. And these fibers have the same light transmitting properties as fiber optic cables. The, so there's a lot of potential as well for inspiration and in bio-inspired design um, and copying how sponges do what they do. And yet human interactions with sponges also uh, can be negative. Uh, and so here, this is deep sea trawling, and this is a trawl moving across the seafloor. And you can see that um, there's a coral that was just taken out by that trawl. So while the deep sea seems remote, our reach extends down to its depths. Uh, trawling can bring up many fish, but also a lot of bycatch. So here, this was a trawl that was done in the North Atlantic. And while it did catch some fish that might have been targeted, there's also a lot of those oster sponges uh, in that as well. So I want to talk now about what effect deep sponges have on their environment and how they do it. How do they catch their food, transform it, um, and excrete it, and at what energetic cost to them. So I'll just show a little bit of the insides of a sponge. And I know all of this is new and all of this is different, but I just think that seeing it helps us all to understand it so that we can then think about um, the role of sponges in any of the thoughts that we have in terms of conservation or just understanding how our oceans work. So sponges are able to eat tiny particles as small as 100 nanometers now the width of one of our hairs is about 100,000 nanometers. So this is tiny. So these are tiny bacteria that were caught inside the tissue of this sponge. Um, and you can see that they are caught and also that there's not a lot of sponge tissue around it. I want you to just keep that in mind for the next slide. Uh, and also we found that sponges then poop those particles out uh, in much larger fecal packets or fecal pellets. And so here, this, this is, I know, sponge poop, um, but these spheres in here are the plastic spheres that we use to trace feeding by the sponges. And so with this, it may sound gross, but uh, by taking particles that are too small for other animals to eat and packaging them into fecal pellets that are larger, Sponges are actually potentially making these foods available for other animals living on the deep sea floor, like this sea pig snuffling around on the sea floor here. In a place where food is scarce, recycling is very important. 
And we've also studied those oster sponges and they eat in a very different way. So the tissue of that species is chock full, super, super dense, not sparse like you see, saw on the previous slide. And this one is full of bacteria that are living inside of its tissue. And zooming in, we found that these sponges do eat bacteria from the water, but they also engulf the bacteria that live inside of their tissue. Essentially, these sponges are farming in the deep ocean to be able to get enough food. And still other sponge species have even turned from their filter feeding ways to become carnivores. So these are all predatory sponges like the harp sponge um, and these pipe cleaner sponges and the Sputnik sponge that will ensnare prey and then digest them on the deep sea floor. So what we found from studying sponges in the deep sea is that not all species make their living in the same way, but they all have adaptations to survive where there's little food. And in fact, by doing so, sponges are important for creating these oases or habitats where there is more food, either through their sponge poop or just by becoming sponge that can be eaten by other animals nearby. Now our newest research is we wanna understand how much food energy goes travels through a sponge. Um, and so we wanna calculate that energy budget. And to do that, just like with humans, we need to measure the energy that comes in from food and the energy that's spent. Uh, so just like this man running on a treadmill, one would measure his oxygen to understand how much energy it takes for him to run. We can do the same with sponges in the deep sea. Again, using technology, this is in collaboration with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And here's a sponge uh, that we're measuring oxygen consumption from, and you can see the measurements from the water surrounding the sponge, um, and then the measurements from inside the sponge, and that difference is how much oxygen the sponges are removing. And we find that actually they're not removing that much. Um, so that means that they're not burning many calories to be able to be living down there in the deep ocean. And finally, we're looking at how hard sponges are working to process that water and to feed by studying their pumping rates. So we are using a new technology that I uh, believe Kakani Katija is going to speak later today about uh, called deep PIV. This is a this will allow us to see the water that's being pumped out of the sponge so that we can measure. Uh, how much they are contributing, how much poop is coming out of them, and therefore how much um, they're contributing to the deep sea. So now you know when you see a sponge, they may look like lumps on the seafloor, but in fact they're working hard, pumping water through them and filtering out bacteria. So going back to our questions, sponges can act as oases in food poor habitats, and they do that by catching food in a lot of different ways or using a low cost lifestyle. I just want to return one more time to this time lapse of the deep sea floor. And I know it can be distracting looking at all the sea cucumbers snuffling around, but I want you to keep an eye on this tulip shaped sponge here. And I think the last thing that I just want to impart to you is there's a lot we've been learning about sponges. There's a lot we still don't know, but a lot of this is also that we're looking at them from a lens of our own time scale. And if you watch this sponge, you can see it contracts and expands and contracts again. And we didn't see that until we had this five month record of time lapse because these sponges take about two days to contract all the way down to their contracted size and then two more days to expand back up to their full size. And so we're just not necessarily capturing life at the same time scale as what these animals are living at, which I think is really incredible. So again, to effectively conserve something, we must first understand it. Hopefully with this talk, you've learned a little bit more about sponges uh, and just know what sorts of roles they have in their ocean communities. And I'll just stop with this slide here so we can acknowledge all of the support that goes into studying the deep sea, which is a pretty massive endeavor. Thank you. Wow, very cool. Thank you so much. Look at all those partners. I, you know, my very first question is, like, what is it like to do this research? There, how do you get to the deepest bottom of the sea when, when we're looking at that time-lapse footage? It, it looks pretty incredible. And I'm sure the first time you saw that, you were pretty excited. So can you tell me like the process of how, um, how, how it all works? 
Yeah, definitely. And you are right. It is mind blowing to be out there and realizing that you're seeing the deep ocean. Um, and so really, this is now I get to take advantage of some amazing ingenuity by engineers and partnered with scientists to come up with these goals. The scientists will recognize um, what's interesting to study, for example, the flow of nutrients through sponges. And then they they collaborate with engineers to figure out what sorts of technology is needed. Um, and then we need to do lots of planning. It's almost like having a space flight mission, except that instead of going up out of the atmosphere, we're going down into the deep ocean. Um, and we stay safely on the ship, but the equipment goes down. And um, yeah, it's amazing how much technology really is involved. I'm sure you're watching it go down, just saying, wow, it's really getting deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> Yeah, and one of the things that doesn't really uh, doesn't really translate in these videos is how long it takes to get to the deep sea. So with that remotely operated vehicle, to get down to 4,000 meters takes about three hours for it to just descend, uh, you wow. know, and so you're just, you realize how far it is. Wow, that's, that's really fun. All right, I'm going to take a question from the chat here. We have Kate F. She's tuning in from the rural forest of West Wales in the UK. And Kate asks, are there any Humboldt squid in the Californian uh, Marine Canyon? Oh, great question, Kate. I don't know if there are right now, but there definitely have been in the recent past. So Humboldt squid are typically more often found further south in Southern California and Baja California. But during periods when we have warmer water, like El Nino years, or when we had a marine heat wave um, a few, about five years ago, we saw Humboldt squid coming up as far north as this. So yes, we do have Humboldt squid at certain times in the Monterey Canyon. Wow, great. great Any question. other um, unexpected wildlife that you see or have seen? I was actually very fortunate to be on a research cruise where we stumbled upon um, a very neat aggregation of deep sea octopuses. And actually, Joe Grabowski was on that cruise as well, one of the um, organizers of this uh, festival. So um, yeah, we stumbled upon oh, thousands of deep sea octopuses all brooding their eggs on the deep sea floor in, in mass. Like we just didn't know. Usually you're excited if you see one octopus on a dive. And now here we are seeing this massive aggregation. So it's one of those moments where even if even if we were not um, benthic biologists, which we are, we would have recognized that it's important to stop here and figure out what's going on. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have one more question from Steve Andrews. Steve goes, what about microplastics and sponges? What effect is plastic pollution having on sponges? I have the same question, Steve. Yeah, I, I do too, Steve, to be honest. And I mean, I think the truth is there aren't very many people that are studying sponges right now. So um, we don't know yet. But what we do know, what I know from studying their feeding is I feed them microplastics to understand what sizes and what types of foods they can catch. And they catch just about every piece of plastic that I feed to them. So definitely they would be feeding and they would be capturing those. Now, whether the, the plastics are harming them or whether they are moving plastics out of the water column and into the seafloor is something that just hasn't really been studied yet. But I think that is the perfect question because as filter feeders, microplastics are something they're going to be exposed to and that they'll definitely um, end up handling. Yeah, it, it sounds like, you know, during Global BioFest, we've heard about all the different conservation efforts that are um, going around and all, so many different issues that are impacting animals, but it almost sounds like we don't really know what are, what is in our deep sea and how they're being impacted by humans. Um, are there any other signs of, of human um, interactions or any other threats to these deep sea creature, creatures? Mm. Um, there are, yeah, depending on where you are, those threats may vary. So fishing is a big one. So is deep sea mining, like our previous speaker uh, spoke about. Um, so that can 
any activity that might kick up sediments would really influence something that has to filter a lot of water because that could clog the filters. Um, and so, yeah, those would all affect sponges. And then also, while we don't know those effects, definitely everything that's happening with climate change in shallow water is absolutely reaching the deep sea. So we are seeing major changes in the ocean's pH or acidity levels. And also there are changes in the nutrient or oxygen concentrations that we see, um, which can all have big effects on the animals down there, including sponges. Wow. Well, thank you so much for studying it because really it sounds like we need more research and the work that you're doing is pretty incredibly cool to see all the information that you're gathering for us to be able to um, use that information for policy and to really understand these impacts of climate change and everything. We have one more question back to Kate. Uh, well, first she goes, uh, she loves Humboldt squid. And she also asks, what is your favorite sponge? Mm, oh, my favorite sponge. I actually had it there in my talk. So it is this massive sponge. We don't know what species it is yet, which I think is really fun. Um, and it it looks like a gramophone. It, it's massive. It's about a meter tall. And then it flares out once it gets to a certain height. And they're always the same height in the same region when they flare out. And I just want to know why they grow the way they do. And um, and yeah, so that's a deep sea sponge. It's called a glass sponge and it makes its skeleton out of glass. Um, and beyond that, we need to figure out what species it is. And can, just a sidebar of well, the other fun thing about the deep ocean is most of the animals that we see are not described or they're new to science. And so really it is an amazing frontier of exploration that we still have on planet earth to figure out who all of these species are. Wow. So can you can you share with us what is your next research question or your next research project? Where are you going? And what can we expect next year at Global Biofest? Ooh, well, to be honest, I was thinking about studying microplastics in sponges. So um, I'll see how far I get in that. Um, but the other big thing is just to uh, to figure out what effect they are having in their environment. So if we can actually sort of connect the dots and find out what whether food is really transferred from the sponges to other animals and uh, really solidify those pathways so that we know how there can be so many animals living in a place where it doesn't seem like there's a lot of food. Just, yeah, figuring that out. It sure doesn't. And it can really help us understand beyond just the global bio fest, maybe into space and beyond. <laughs> Definitely, definitely, especially with such ancient animals. Yeah, well, great. Thank you so much for your work um, contributing towards this amazing scientific knowledge. And thanks so much for joining us today at Global BioFest. Uh, amazing presentation. I know I learned a lot. I'll never look at a sponge in a different way. <laughs> Every time <laughs> yes. I'm doing the dishes, I'll think about how, <laughs> how cool they are. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. That was the goal. So I'm so happy. And thank you for such an amazing festival. I'm looking forward to the rest of the fest. We're closing out today. We're almost done. I know. Can yeah. you believe it? <laughs> All right. Thanks, Amanda. Take care.